posted there. So we were having to uh, examine. So Jennifer, Dennis, and I have been looking at the geographical signature of aerial eradication. How effective has the eradication program been? And that sounded like a, a, a really exciting uh, research. And there's two papers earlier by another researcher, um, uh, Rincon Ruiz, in 2013. So one came out like in December 28th and the other one like in January. And he's answered that question too and he got the same answer that we did. And the answer is how effective has the eradication program been? Um, the answer is not very, it hasn't been very effective. So I decided that since uh, there are a flurry of papers that are already coming in that field. I would present uh, more recent work that's on the markets for beef, markets for land, and why we have to look way beyond coca to understand coca. So we just had uh, Danielle give a really interesting presentation about the Pacific coast of Colombia, which happens to be one of the most biologically diverse parts of the world. And here's a picture of the kind of process, a fragmentation process that's happening in, in, in that part of the world. So we have the coca plot here, then we have some uh, trees around some jungle, what used to be jungle, but is now being fragmented uh, for coca cultivation. In my lab, I focus on um, two different kinds of questions. I, I usually work, so my day job, I work on uh, processes that increase uh, biological diversity, that's diversification and speciation. And then I've taken on this whole other side in which I examine the processes that decrease biological diversity, and that's what I'm focusing on. And I focus particularly on habitat loss. Habitats are really important because most of the species that we know of that are threatened or endangered are actually threatened or endangered by habitat loss. So here's a picture from study as, uh, a series of studies that were done by the uh, IUCN um, in the last few years. And, and here, lo and behold, most of the species are threatened by this. There's a little bit of hunting trapping. That's because we like to eat mammals. We like to eat meat. But on average, if you pick any one species of plant, of invertebrate, of animal, you pick it out. It's the loss of habitat that's driving them uh, extinct. So this is really important from a biological uh, point of view. Adriana earlier showed some pictures like this. Here's just for effect. This is what a closed forest looks like. This is a lowland Amazonian forest. And this is what uh, some of these fragmentation um, and deforestation processes look like. You, you have this uh, very biologically diverse Andean forest that is getting there. It's got some burning and erosion going on. So there have been a lot of explanations as to why deforestation happens. What is it that deforestation is important? And you know, I have to tell you as a biologist that most of us biologists, most of us who work um, looking at, 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 at these kind of processes are really convinced that the drivers, the ultimate driver of all these processes is demographic expansion. It's simply you have more people consuming more resources, taking up more space, building more houses. We've all seen it. We've all gone back to the neighborhood of our youth where there used to be a wood or a river or anything, and now there's a shopping mall or anything. So we're all aware of this, how this demographic process, human demography, actually plays a role in the environment. But what I'm going to show is an example in which the answers are not quite as clear. In Colombia, so if we, if we take the problem of deforestation in Colombia, which has been uh, at an elevated rate in the last 10 years, and this is, uh, Adriana showed some of those uh, examples earlier. This is the rate of population growth um, of the rural population, so the people that are living on the land, not the people that are living in the towns and the cities, in the last 40 years. And so what you see is this, this striking upward trend, right? Not really. So if you look at this, you, you know, if you think about it, and this is something that I tell my students when they look at graphs like this, is if, if this doesn't connect to you, if you don't understand what 1% is in population growth, just think that if this was money, would you really like to put your money in a bank that's going to pay you 0.2% interest return on your money? <laughs> so the answer, is, the answer is the population, you know, if we say, well, there's this accelerating pace of destruction that is happening in this part of the world, and, and we come back and we say, you know, as a biologist, my instinct is to say that this tremendous growth in human population is what's doing that. That's not what we find from the data in Colombia, at least the global data. There are variations on a common theme, but the common theme that we have in this part of the world is a loss of population of the countryside, a depopulation of the countryside. This has not ad abated. It, it, it's an ongoing process. So to take an in-depth look, I took the data that uh, Dolores Armenteras has been generating in the Guaviare, and she's generated a really great annual time series from 2001 to 2010 for this part of the world. Now, 
the Guaviare in Colombia was one of two main foci of Plan Colombia. So the Plan Colombia was this large investment by the Colombian government and the American government, so it's taxpayers' money at work, that was focused on the reduction of the acreage of coca plantations. So the goal was to just reduce the amount of cocaine that came into the United States and, uh, and by, by the supply side. So it's a supply side kind of uh, uh, investment. And the first one was Putumayo, which is somewhere south of here. And, and the second one was Guaviare, one of the big focus. So there was a big push. Your dollars, my dollars, they all went into trying to get rid of cocaine in a place like this. Uh, the Guaviare is a region that has very poor development. There's high illiteracy high child mortality, and historically, the only economic activities have been extractive land uses. So to summarize a wealth of data that we have from those areas, this is what's been going on in terms of the landscape of the Guaviare. So we have here, the forest has been steadily declining. So we have 50% of cover in forest in, in the places that we were looking at, and we get down to 25%. So that's like the, the forest just went about half in the area that was under study. Conversely, we have pastures going from 25% of the, of the cover, of the land cover, to about 40%. And then with coca, here's the thing. Uh, with coca, we have a decline in coca production. Now, these graphs that you're seeing here are fragmentation indices. These fragmentation indices actually help us understand what the landscape looks like in a quantitative manner. And this, like, this, um, the, one, the only one that I'm going to focus on right now is here. This, nearest distance between patches. So what we're seeing with this increasing nearest distance is that the patches of forest are actually becoming isolated from one another. What that means in terms of biological diversity is that it's harder for species that are in one patch to actually get together with individuals in other, uh, in other patch. The patches are more and more disconnected. Once again, we have this striking pattern. And the same thing is happening with coca cultivation, whereas pastures are coming closer together. And in, in most of the time, they're just coalescing. So they're like you know, patches that grow, 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 and then they coalesce into a giant pasture. So there are three general explanations that have emerged. Uh, deforestation in, in Amazonia is nothing new. There are scores of papers that are devoted. You know, oftentimes we hear like Brazilian Amazon has lost something like uh, three Belgiums in five years or something like that. So there are just huge areas that are deforested. So out of this, what has emerged is these three explanations. Um, the first one is this one that's called the hamburger connection. And it's the idea that people are deforesting and they're transforming this landscape into pastures. And then those pastures have cattle of them. And then, you, and then, and then we buy the cattle, either in the international market or within the country. So people like to eat beef. And so I call, I call within domestic consumption, I call it the steak connection. And then the international one is the hamburger connection because it gets exported and it gets sold cheaply at McDonald's. That's where this hypothesis comes from. The second one is something we published a couple of years ago where we said that coca was a very important dri driver of this um, uh, land use transformation and fragmentation in this part of the world uh, in Amazonia. And then finally, there's another hypothesis that is really interesting and quite nuanced. I'm going to try to summarize it as best I, 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 I can, but Susanna Hecht argued that instead of thinking about this purely economic scenario in which you have the pastures and then you put the cattle on them and then people buy the beef and that's how you make money and that, that's the logic of livestock, that instead we should look to land tenure practices. And those land tenure practices are something like uh, a description that Diana gave earlier today in which um, you put the cattle in the landscape and then you fence them in and you don't, you know, later on this property, this, you know, whenever there is some kind of subtraction from the land reserve, then you can get your hands on some kind of title or compraventa, some kind of legal standing for your land. And you can do that if you have cattle, but you cannot do that if you have forest. And it's actually really hard to do that if you have crops. So she argued that actually it makes sense to have pastures and it even makes sense to have cattle, but the cattle don't even need to make money as long as you have this land that eventually will become yours as part of that. So to investigate this, um, of course, I've focused uh, over such a long period of time looking into this coca as a driver of deforestation that I was interested in coca. And then it's interesting because um, if coca were really the cause of deforestation is part of the world, then perhaps coca eradication would be the solution. It's great because 
according to all the policies that we've been following under Plan Colombia for more than 10 years now, then we can solve the problem of coca. So we have eradication, and the eradication will decrease the amount of coca. And with decreasing amounts of coca, we will perhaps watch some of that forest grow back, or we will watch that, that forest not decline. We'll see in a second how that panned out. So the first thing that I, that I looked at was the cattle. And so here, up here, we see the cattle, the trends for cattle over the period of time. And you can see that the number of heads of cattle that were in the area has almost tripled over this 10-year period. So in other words, we could say that those pastures have been growing and in tandem with the number of cattle. Unfortunately, when we look at the prices of the beef, which is the economic explanation for what's going on with this cattle, you can see that the, the prices of the beef have increased during that period only by about 8% in real terms. To put that into perspective, that's about the, the equivalent of about 10 cent, 10, 10 American cents per kilogram. Um, and it really, even in Colombian terms, in, in terms of a rural economy, it's a very small yield uh, for anybody's investment. You can also see that the prices fluctuate a lot over time. So that the economic explanation seems to be less solid when we look at these prices. And then finally, when we look at the actual records of how much revenue people are getting in from the cattle, it's actually plummeted. It's gone, it's gone from more than 35 billion pesos at the beginning of the time period to something on the order of 10. So it's really collapsed over that time period. We also found that there was a significant relationship between the coca and the pasture, but this relationship suggested that the pastures were heavily under, underutilized. We're on the order, if we scale the coefficients and we take into account that the number of cows are measured in one scale and the amount of pasture in a different scale, then it would give us about one-tenth of a cow per hectare. So it would give us a really low number, a real low exploitation of those, even though, even in the context of this extensive land use, we're still underutilizing the pasture with the cattle that we have. So this explanation doesn't seem to be so great. The other explanation that I had is, well, coca, you know, coca may be the main player, coca may be the thing that's going on. But of course, we saw that coca was declining from the start. And then I thought, well, that's great. Coca's declining, and it's probably because of the eradication, since we've poured so much taxpayer money going in. This is the relationship between the eradication that's gone on the year previous and the coca cultivation that we observe in the year following that eradication effort. What do you think? There's no significant relationship. You can do all kinds of transformations. You can do all kinds of statistical tricks. You just don't see it. You know, the forest was lost, but the coca declined. And the coca decline doesn't appear to be related to the aerial spraying that was going on. The analysis don't show any relationship. And believe me, I tried very hard. So why did the coca cultivation decline? Well, instead, what we see here is a, a, a modeling approach in which we have the different municipalities that are part of this region um, modeled with, with separate intercepts. So they're, they're just beginning with different amounts of coca cultivation to start off with. And they decline as their population becomes more urban. So that's what we see here. So by the time any one uh, township in this part of the world has about 50% of an urban population, it ends up uh, having almost no coca. So in this time period, that's the relationship that we see. We see that coca decline is related to the, to the concentration of people into towns. And so to explore the issue of urbanization and to explore how this could be connected to uh, Susanna Heck's um, logic of livestock, or logic of laws tending to make pastures valuable to people, we looked at this receipts of property taxes over time in the region and some other aspects of revenue that were coming into this part of the world. And what we found was really quite striking. What we found is that on a per capita basis, so even as that urban population is growing, right, they're becoming more concentrated. So the countryside is becoming depopulated. The people are moving to the cities. Each one of those persons who is living in the town is actually paying more property taxes. And then those property taxes are getting invested into the local infrastructure. So you can see quite a, you know, there, there's actually parallel lines that are going on. The financial, the financial sector becomes more important. There's a lot less economic dependence on ranching and agriculture in this part of the world. And instead, we have more relationship with a more developed economy that has to do with this. Now, to get back to the issue, to, to the environmental issues, this model is not 
benign by, by any stretch because in the process, we've lost a huge amount of forest cover and the forest that was left is this isolated patches. We have this urban cows. The cows enhance the claim to the land. The region is rapidly urbanizing, which gives rise to landscapes like this in which we have this urbanizing, you know, this, this little setup of development here and you have the cows side by side establishing the claims to the land with the people who are already urban. These are urban people. Look at the way they're dressed. They're in the latest fashion. So you, can, you know that this is what's happening. The property values are rising for these people because they have this infrastructure. And probably the relationship to get back to that hypothesis, clearing the land to actually connect to this uh, future urban market or this really current urban market. This is a disturbing model of development. It's disturbing, but it is actually the typical model of development. It's the way that virtually all of Latin America has developed. So there's really, we really don't have examples of sustainable, from an ecological standpoint, sustainable developments in this part of the world. And this confirms it. So the development is actively excluding the coca cultivation. It's not the eradication that's playing that role. And development is, this development is centered on a model of set, settlement that is destructive to, this for, to the forest. And although we didn't examine it in this work, it's probably not peaceful by any means. And this is something that was very helpfully pointed out to me by uh, Maria Clara. So instead of having this simple model that we saw earlier in which eradication decreases coca, instead we have this more multidimensional setup in which more eradication, nothing coca, it really doesn't have any effect, even though I put the arrow. We have urbanization and development decreasing coca. The coca becomes pasture and cows, and the pasture and cows are property, which they weren't before. When the land is standing with forests, it's not property. It's part of the land reserve. So we're missing the real point. We have to step back and look at this as a system. So if we really care, if we, whether we, whichever side we are on, on whether the war on drugs is having an effect or not, we have to think of this as a system in which the ultimate fate of the landscapes where coca, coca is being cultivated and the ultimate fate of the people who are taking those actions to cultivate coca and then to abandon coca are taken into account. Because otherwise, we're actually missing the whole, the whole picture. And with that, I'd like to thank the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and my collaborators and the members of the Davalos Lab who've worked on this project. Thanks.